Better, braver, less likely. True. Have you seen those before in the discussion on this curious thing called learning? In email? Yes, yeah, yeah. Now, in terms of your. I have not worked on reading this, but I have seen courage in to 10 and 11. Look at that. In contemplation. <laughs> Okay, this is the big jump into metaphysics. First principles. on in my pocket. Oh, you're in the range? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> what then <clears throat> is the one? It is what makes all things possible. Without it, nothing would exist, neither being nor the intelligence, <clears throat> nor the highest life, nor anything else. What is above life is the cause of life. The activity of life, <clears throat> being all things, is not the first principle. It flows from it as from a spring. Picture a spring that has no further origin, that pours itself into all rivers without becoming exhausted of what it yields and remains what it is, undisturbed. <clears throat> the streams that issue from it before, before flowing away each in its own direction, mingle together for a time, but each knows already where it will take its flood. Or think of the life that circulates in a great tree. The originating principle of this life remains at rest and does not spread through the tree because it has, as it were, its seat in the root. The principle gives to the plant all its life and its multiplicity, but remains itself at rest. Not a plurality, it's the source of plurality. This is, this is not surprising. Where is there a place for surprise that the multiplicity of life issues from what is not multiple? And the multi multiple would not exist without the previous existence of that which is not multiple. The principle is not distributed through the, through the cosmos. If it were, the cosmos would be uh, annihilated and could not be born again unless the principle remained self-contained in its otherness. That's why everywhere things are reduced to unity. For each thing there is a unity to which it may be reduced. And there is for each unity that which is superior to it, but is not unity as such. This continues until one reaches unity as such which cannot be reduced to any other. That's it. All right, so look how he ends it. Three paragraphs. To grasp the oneness of a tree, that is its stable principle, 
or of an animal or of a soul or of the cosmos is to grasp in each of these cases what is most powerful and of worth. If at last we try to grasp the oneness that is found in the true realities and is their principal source and productive power, how can we all of a sudden become doubtful and believe that this principle is nothingness? This principle is certainly none of the things of which it is the source. It is such that nothing can be predicated of it, not being, not substance, not life, because it is superior to all these things. But if you uh, manage to grasp it by abstracting even being from it, you know what? You'll be struck with wonder. By, by directing your glance towards it, by reaching it, by resting in it, you will achieve a deep and immediate awareness of it and will at the same time seize its greatness and all the things that come from it and exist through it. It's meditation, isn't it? Right? It's meditation. It's an invitation right? to participate in it. A beautiful invitation. Pardon? A beautiful invitation. Yes, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, yeah. But if you manage to grasp it by abstracting even being from it, you'll be struck with wonder. By directing your glance towards it, by reaching it, by resting in it, you'll achieve a deep and immediate awareness of it and uh, will at the same time seize its greatness in all things that come from it and exist through it. Jump in. So what does it mean <clears throat> to manage to grasp it by abstracting even being from it? Yeah. By the way, uh, are you familiar with this notion? Louder? I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one is, right? Yes. Yeah, people talk about it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, by the way, is uh, <coughs> what does this do? Implies being. Ah, it implies that uh, the one has it. Yeah. Has a quality. Yeah. yeah. By the way, is what you have what you are or? Are you the possessor of what you have? You're the possessor of what you have. Oh. Then, if the one has being, the one is not being. Is that right? Yeah. It's prior to it. See, I just put my coat down. The coat's on me. I possessed it. So I can put my coat down. Right? So therefore, if you talk about the one, what do you have to abstract from it? Being. Yeah. What does this do? It's a definite article. Yeah, what does it do, though? It makes it singular. No, no. What's the difference? The first is higher. It's superior Why? To it. What does it do? It implies only. Would you like some help? Yeah. Yeah. Only. Only. The one. Uh, only. That was helpful. More? Because if you say A1, that means there can be others. Right. So it's, it's singular, yeah. The one. 
that right? Yes. But that assumes that you're not going to mix, mix it with others, so you're still thinking in terms of others, are you not, when you use the word the? Well, then, <laughs> even though, well, I guess we just have to take that away, don't we? We just abstracted being from it and being a thing. What does that do? It makes me very confused. What does it do? It confuses me. Now talk more about what you think confusion is. I'm trying to grasp, it feels like I'm trying to grasp something that isn't there. You could, would you read that paragraph now? But if you manage, go ahead. But if you manage to grasp it by abstracting even being from it. That's what you did. Yeah. Go ahead. You will be struck with wonder. <laughs> <laughs> well, that worked. That worked. <laughs> <laughs> How about going further? Sure. But now, hey, by uh, right, what are you going to do? Directing your glance towards. Right, it. take a glance towards it. Yeah. By reaching it, by resting in it you will achieve a deep and immediate awareness of it and will at the same time seize its greatness in all things that come from it. Say, by the way, uh, you, you're dealing with this idea, you know? Is it an idea, though? No. I'm not adding anything to it. I'm taking things away. Yeah, 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 yeah. But at least you're separating it from all other things. Yeah. Right? So you're separating out all other things. Well, then you need other things in order to grasp it. Because you're saying it's not other things. It's still finish it. It's you still need other a, things to Yeah, in order to talk about it. And you need I need other things to uh, uh, well, we don't want to do that. Because it's not in any way like other things. Right, I'm saying what it's not. Yeah, yeah, so we don't want to do that. Yeah. What's it like? Feels like I'm trying to grab hold of something that I that can't be grabbed hold of. No, but we're trying to direct your glance towards it, are we not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's curious, isn't it? And we won't, what happens to you? You kind of pull away from it? Yeah, read it again first. By directing your glance towards it, by reaching it. By resting in it, you will achieve a deep and immediate awareness of it, and will at the same time seize its greatness in all things that come from it and exist through it. Hmm. See, you are directing your glance towards it in that sense, right? And he's saying, stay there in the state of mind that you are now experiencing. That grasping for something that I can't yeah, grasp. Yeah, hold yeah. Hmm. So, this thing that you are, uh, see, but I called it a what? A one. A thing? Yeah, you called it. It's not a thing. No. Oh, yeah, okay. But nonetheless, it makes all things possible. That's rather curious, isn't it? <coughs> uh, can't say anything about it, but it's the makes all things, all other things possible. You can see how other things share in it. Yeah, yeah. Even though it's not in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, could you read the first paragraph for me? 
sorry. After what then is the one on number 10? <clears throat> it is what makes all things possible. Ah! Boom! Okay. Okay. It makes it possible. Huh. 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 Matter of fact, without it, nothing would exist. Nothing would exist. Neither being, huh. nor the intelligence, nor the highest light, nor anything else. Even the quality of unity wouldn't exist without it. Yeah, but see, um, that's an interesting notion. See, it's not unity, it's but the quality of unity. Look, um, you ever use this word? Um, Yeah. <laughs> Unityness? What's this laughing about? Sorry, I didn't read it and now I'm laughing. All right. What do you see? Anything peculiar about this word? Mm, yeah. What? <laughs> Is it like a quality of a quality? We don't use it. Quality of unity. We don't use it, but <laughs> if we were to, what would it mean? The property of unity. That's right. The, that which all unities have yeah. in common. Yeah. 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 Um. <clears throat> you know, if someone had an expensive watch, I could do a exercise with them. Okay. Okay. Let me have it. Okay. Uh, would you agree uh, it's got many parts, it holds, has many hearts? And, uh, <laughs> 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 it's not expensive. I'm going to give all the parts back to her <laughs> so she can't complain that I didn't get her back. Her watch because all the parts are there. Okay. Oh God. Okay. Thanks. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. But you didn't include the unityness. Oh. You just. In fact, she wants those parts in a certain order. Unity. Unity arrangement and the in arrangement must order. have a certain order. unity. Ah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. But all you can see are the parts. Right. Ah. Right, you can't see the unity. How, how important in that watch is the unity? Might you even give up, if necessary, a couple of the parts in order to have the functioning unity? Yeah. Ah. It's yeah. the most important thing. Depending upon what part it is. Yeah, possible, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's a... Uh, it has the quality of unity means there's a property of unity, which is what? Oneness. Does everything that has a quantity, a, quanti a unity, have a quality, and that's the qualityness or the oneness? But no thing is the one. But anything that is a whole must have parts, and that is a one. So everything is one, isn't it? Different ways of talking about one. Anything you would call Each one of these is a one. The whole is a one. The arrangement of the parts is a one. These are all different ways of talking about the way you can talk about one in respect to that watch. And the way it then functions, one, 
or oneness? Is it the quality of one? When you destroyed that beautiful watch, Pardon? when you destroyed that beautiful watch, you returned all the parts to her. I didn't destroy the watch, I gave her all the parts. You gave her all the parts, but you didn't give her the value of the parts, which means that the quality is a certain value beyond what the quantity of the parts no, no. are. It adds a quality to it. A value. A value, right, 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 right. Far beyond, in some cases, some the of the stuff. parts. Huh. Then the highest quality of anything is its oneness. Mm -hmm. Well, then, without oneness, finish it. There's nothing. There's nothing. You see, even being, being is one. Intelligence is one. All highest life, one. And necessarily, <clears throat> the the quality of oneness oneness comes from the one. No, that's even though you can't really say anything. Yeah, that's what you're saying. See. Um, this is why the post primals is so important. Right, just a quick, just that one sentence. We did it once before, but I, it's a favorite of mine. I'm on page 107 on Post Primal, section 1. <clears throat> Yet, how can everything come from the one, which is simple and apparently has within it no multiplicity or duality whatsoever? Everything can come from it precisely because there's no thing in it. In order that being be, the one must be not being, but being's begetter. This then, it may be said, is the primal begetting. Perfect, seeking nothing, having nothing, needing nothing. And he uses the image of overflowing, doesn't he? Let's see if we can, we can add more of that same thing we were doing. If the one needs nothing, beyond all predicates, look here, beyond all predicates, The one is beyond all predicates. How can it be the cause of that which is the sum of all perfections? Because the sum of all perfections is being.
beings also goes by several names, depending upon how you want to explore it. It's beauty itself, right? it's the most brilliant light of being, right? uh, wisdom, right? source of truth, Greater than anything to be conceived, greater than anything of anything that can be perceived, conceived, either way. Is it well, the therefore, spirit? each of these can be called perfections. So it's the sum of all perfections. That's called being. It also can take on these other names in different contexts. So how can something that's beyond all predicates be the cause of that which is the sum of all perfections? Now, if you're dealing with that, then you can deal with the next puzzle. How can that which is the sum of all perfections be the cause of all the imperfections In the cosmos. Cosmos or universe, Peter? Well, I don't use the... Yeah. See, it, often you can make a distinction between cosmos and universe. Universe is, is some total of, of the things. Okay, so cosmos, cosmos should mean the things as well as the principles, which is a Platonic distinction. Okay, all right. right. Cosmos is correct. No, yeah. no. no. Okay. So how can this turn out to be the cause of the cosmo, cosmos with all of its imperfections. The one goes slumming. <laughs> the one goes slumming. Yeah. <laughs> so these are the... That's a good... <laughs> yeah. Could, could it be that there is a loss or degradation of unity? And that's how... The sum of all perfections can be the cause of... Well, the imperfections. Of the imperfections. Isn't that weird? Could it be because there is less unity when you go down? No. Oneness. Oneness. Not unity. Oneness. Because another name for this is oneness. We can put that in there too. But Piers, can't, can't you say that since Uranus, Kronos, and Zeus are not the one, there is no a degradation. There is no. There is a degradation yes. of the quality. Oh yes. Even at that at the cosmos oh, level. Yes. yes. Each they level. Are, they are not the one. No. Okay. No. Quite true. Yeah. Okay. Quite true. Each copy of that. Shall we um, I don't push? I get how it's the cause of degradation. I haven't. I don't think I've missed what's been said. But uh, like, simply because it begets, and what it begets is less than itself. Therefore, it's the cause of the lesser than itself. Therefore, it's the cause of degradation. Is that the way that works? Yes. Not really degradation. Not degradation. <laughs> Im imperfections. Not degradation. Well, these guys have been using. I know, but that has another another association with it. Well, how how could it take the the alternative? How could it be against something that? Uh, this is only, Yeah, except in Brooklyn. <laughs> well, then on the other hand, if it's the it's how can that which is the sum of all perfections be considered the cause of imperfection? Yeah, and go the other way. Right. And how can that which is beyond all predicates be the cause of that which has the sum of all perfections? Yes. Totally confused now. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Now that we're in a good place then, let's go back to contemplation and look at the last section. Eleven. Now this is real fun. This is real fun. Okay.
consider now <clears throat> the following. Since the intelligence is a sort of seeing, that is, a seeing that's active, it really is a potentiality actualized. One, therefore, will have to distinguish it both, uh, distinguish in it both form and matter. Active seeing implies a duality, while before its actualization it was <coughs> unity. Thus unity has become duality and duality has become unity. As our seeing needs the realm of sense for its actualization and perfecting, its seeing needs the good. If the intelligence were itself the good, why would it need to see or even to act in any way? Though other things act only for and by the good, the good has no such necessity. There's nothing for it except itself. After one has pronounced the word good, one should uh, ascribe nothing further to it because any addition of whatever sort will make it less than it really is. Not even thought should be attributed to it. To do that would be to introduce a difference and thus make it a duality of intellectual intellection and goodness. The intelligence needs the good. The good needs not the intelligence. Upon attaining it, the intelligence becomes like the good because it's formed and perfected by it. See its trace, its imprint in the intelligence and you can conceive the good. Seeing this trace is, right, in itself, the intelligence knows desire. Seeing this trace in itself, the intelligence knows desire. Right? Seeing this trace in itself, the intelligence knows desire. The intellig intelligence desires at every moment, and at every moment achieves its desire. The good knows no desire. <laughs> what could it desire? Having no desire... <laughs> It fulfills no desire. It's not the same then as the intelligence because the intelligence is the quintessence of appetition and desire. The intelligence is beautiful. Of all things, the most beautiful. Dwelling in pure light and stainless radiance. It envelops everything with its own light. The realm of sense so beautiful is only the, uh, its reflected shadow. It abides in full resplendence because it contains nothing dark to the mind or obscure or indefinite. It knows beatitude. Wonder seizes upon him who contemplates it, who enters in and becomes one with it, just as the view of the heavens and the splendor of the stars leads one to think of their author and to seek him out. So the contemplative, who has gazed upon the intelligible realm and has been struck with the wonder of it, should seek out its author, should seek out who has given it existence, where its author is, and how he authored it. From whom comes this beauty as this, this procession of plenitude? Not the intelligent nor in being, but their prior, they come after it because they have no need of both thought and fulfillment, but they are close to that which wants for nothing, which need not even think. So high its rank, the intelligence is authentic plentitude and thought. Its prior is neither, for if it were, it would not be what it is, the good. Its prior is neither, for if it were, it would not be what it is, the good.
Right, I think a better way to read that. Its prior is neither for. If it were, it would not be what it is, the good. So staying in that uh, paragraph on 175, right? line up the qualities of intelligence, and we have them here, don't we? The intelligence is beautiful, beauty. Most beautiful. Pure light, stainless radiance. It envelops everything with its own light. Knows beatitude or bliss. Right. So, here's his challenge. Get in this. That's pretty great, dude. And you know what? Now do the terribly brave thing. So the contemplative who has gazed upon this intelligible realm, right, has been struck with the wonder of it, should say, hey, where'd this come from? What's the source of this? Good heavens, what's the source of it? What's given it existence? Where the author is? Terrible question. How did he author it? That's this. See, so here we are. How can it be the cause of that which is the sum of all perfections? How can it, how can it pull that off? So what must the contemplative do? Get in here. All right, there he is. She. Right, there they are. I'm right in the middle of it saying, okay. What's the author of this? How did it pull it off? <laughs> if the author of this is the one, how can, how can it possibly do that if it's nothing? It's not nothing. It just said it has no predicates. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> it's a very dangerous game. Uh, You can meet people who experience this, and they can get in it, and uh, it's ultimate. And they go around and they think they have the final answer. And if you come up to them and say, congratulations on that beatific experience, likely that no experience is greater. But you know what? You better find out where it came from. Huh? <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? Can't wait a minute. It's all engulfing. It no, 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 really. There's an author of it. Yeah? No. Well, there's a source of it. Better find out. What are you talking about? It can be very upsetting. In, in a sense, Pierre, you can say it's very almost upsetting. like a drug. Pardon? In a sense, you can say it's almost like a drug. It ex obscures you know, the, the uh, text or, or the context of it, so to yeah. speak? No. Yeah. Well, um, the Buddhists have a good name for people in this, and, you know, uh, because if someone has this experience, is it not likely they walk away from it and they think they're big shit, the locals stink? <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> so they have a good name for it. They call it that guy has the stench of enlightenment. It's not high enough, it's not high enough. Right? There's something beyond it. Now, when I was in England giving a talk, and the, several of the people there brought this young man, I, I don't know if he was young, but 
Are they still young when they're about 28? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure since I reached middle age. I'm not sure about the. <laughs> and they brought him up and they said, hey, here's this great guy who's in this great state. And I had a talk with him and we went through one of these little dialogues. And it wrecked him. It wrecked him. And uh, a couple of days later, one of them came back and said to me, you know what you did? The guy committed suicide. He went in a terrible depression after the talk. He thought he had reached an ultimate state. And in our dialogue, he came to question him, and he hung himself. So they uh, said that I was the cause of that guy's suicide. I said, I don't know, maybe it, you know, maybe it was a good trip. Yeah. You know. Probably got a good answer. Do you think so? Well, yeah. Pardon? Well, if not, the, the conversation might help him in his next life. <laughs> but let's no. hope he gets a better lot, Pierre. Yeah, I hope, I hope he gets a better lot than the one he gave. Us. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd agree, though. This is the story also of the Bhagavad Gita. See, the eleventh chapter, the great transfiguration scene, right of the nature of the Atman and self and this experience luminous, right? How does he describe it? It's as if there were 10,000 suns bursting in the heavens all at once. Arjuna. <laughs> luminous. That's the highest. Yeah. So, now we can have some fun now that we've done this. Section number one. Right. I just jested, did I not? What was it like when I pulled out a couple of st statements a moment ago? Come on, what did I call this guy? A nut. Big shit, the local stink? Yeah. Right. What did that do to you at that moment? Presented a form of enlightenment, actually. Yeah. You started what? laughing, that's right. Oh, what? Wow. Right? Yes. It was a, oh, yes, of yeah. course. Yeah. And then the next one, hey, the Buddhists call this stench of enlightenment. Yeah. Two levels, right? Is that fun? <laughs> Seeing it? At that moment, what are you? You woke up. You're using your mind. You're seeing something, are you not? Yeah. Therefore, the best comic, we love to be around them, don't we? We wake up, hey, that was a good one. <laughs> right? No. After coffee, Julie will tell you about the great jokes they would tell in Korea when she was there. The, oh. the great Zen masters had nothing but jokes, and she has a whole book she's written, oh, uh, notebooks full of the jokes that they told over there, so make sure you... That, is that true? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're jokes on the stench of enlightenment, eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could it be true that in jesting we're contemplating? Was I just jesting? Yes. You mean I was contemplating? Yes. Yep. As do all who jest in jesting, we contemplate. Right? We want to contemplate. We want to jest. We want to have fun, right? We want to use our mind. Right? We want to use our mind because that's contemplation. Contemplation is the end of action. Contemplation is the motive, right? Let's all go, hey, there's a good show. Yeah? Is it fun? Yeah, let's go. Right? We're all going to go. See. Mm. Contemplate. That's the performance. Now he pushes it. Would you agree at the end of that? Hey, all nature is contemplating. Now he's going to say, that's how things are produced and begotten. Why? Because nature contemplates. Right? Even though nature doesn't have hands or feet or anything else, there's an action going on. An efficacy that goes out, yet it guides and produces forms. Since nature produces forms and life, that's an activity merging forms, right? Creating forms. 
producing forms. As if, as if nature was in fact an artist that's creating and producing forms, right? You see, therefore all nature is contemplating. He says reason is moving it. He calls it a special kind of reasoning, right? Nature has rational principles behind it. And that's what's pushing these forms. And as uh, a good way to see this, by the way, is uh, Heraclitus' idea of the Logos. The Logos is that which runs and runs through all things and guides all things and everything follows it. Everything is in accordance with the Logos, even though few men are aware of it. That's what he's saying. A rational principle runs through all nature. Heraclitus calls that the Logos. Hey, how does nature achieve this contemplative state? Section 3. What kind of contemplation does it have, nature? I'm on the bottom of 164, section 3. Not the kind that results from discursive reason, but why not since it is life, reason, and productive? Because one plans only when one lacks. Nature doesn't lack, doesn't plan. It produces by the mere fact that it possesses. For it to be is for it to be productive because it is reason, it is contemplation and the object contemplated. Now why does nature contemplate? Section 4. Why does it produce? Why is it so productive? What we call nature is soul. Right, got it? Which I'm in the second paragraph, page 165, section 4. It's begotten by a higher soul of more powerful light, life, and that it contains its contemplation wordlessly within itself with no deflection towards what is higher or lower, abiding within its own realm in self-repose and self-awareness, it sees because of this self-awareness the things that are below it to the extent that they can be seen without further search. It produces at a stroke the object of its contemplation in all its splendor and beauty. For nature remains in repose while contemplating because its object is innate and remains interior and present because nature is itself an object of contemplation, a, a contemplation both wordless and weak. See, wordless and weak. Why does he say that? He needs that. And he doesn't really explore that until section 6. Um, um. <coughs> uh, nature in action is a weak contemplation. See. Nature is a weak contemplation. There's a reason, innate reason works through nature. It's a weak contemplation because it needs 
It needs action to achieve its goal. It needs action. Therefore, it's a weak contemplation. Um, that's true, is it not? In, uh, um, I am going to get, I'm going to go to college, or I'm going to master this and that. I'm going to go through these steps. I'm going to sacrifice for it. Right. Many things, finances, time, energy, because I think the goal is worthwhile. So long as this person keeps that goal in mind and present to them, it's a force that can then propel them through these difficult steps to reach their goal. If they begin to suspect that this goal isn't worth it, that drive is finished. Why do they go through all of this? Because they think if they get their goal, they'll be <laughs> happy Sam the fireman. <laughs> and once that is undermined, what happens to the drive towards that goal? It vanishes. Therefore, this is really a contemplation. They're going to go through all of these actions and use their mind in a variety of ways in training and practices to reach the goal, which they hope will transform them into a better. That's a contemplation. Right? That's the goal. Therefore, the long as the person keeps that goal on their mind and they sacrifice for it, it's a contemplation. They're keeping that idea in their mind and they're contemplating it. Therefore, all action is a weak contemplation. But nature doesn't elect to go through stages. Its goals are within itself. Nature has its own goals within itself. It springs up according to the seasons, according to all kinds of external things, under the right conditions, and it produces. At every stage of its growth, it's perfect at each particular stage. Therefore, it is a weaker contemplation than when we engage in this kind of activity to seek a goal. And if the goal is a state of mind, that is a contemplation. So all action is a weak contemplation, isn't it? Right. Therefore, isn't it best to do nothing? <laughs> Naturally. Naturally. How would you do it naturally? Just sit on your cushion and turn inward. And would you, do you mean you have to look at your in, in your teeth? Maybe you wear something like this. And, and you, you look down? down. <laughs> or you bring a... <laughs> but is that looking inward or is that looking on the surface of things? Oh yeah, surface. Yeah. Well... Well, what I recommend is you get one of those mirrors dentists use. Oh, yeah. And you can then look in, inward. Uh -huh. In a variety of ways, and I'll let your imagination yes. pick it up. Oh. <laughs> On the other hand, the next time I fart, 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 I'll just say it was a weak form of contemplation. And you'd be right. You'd be absolutely right. Right, depending upon the force and the pressure upon that. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so that is... The section on contemplation. It's fun, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Great piece of work. Right, 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 right. Any section you want to talk about? Let's go into it. I just have one question. I'm just looking for a definition of contemplation. Oh, here. Is it, is it a form of unification? Is it really just the process of well, unification? Well, see, if you ask a question and answer it yourself, I'm not going to be foolish to say no. <laughs> So and I'll look good at the same time. You look great. So that's yeah. basically the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so come on, do it yourself. What are you saying? That it looks like contemplation is a form of unification. Unification between two things. Yeah. The, um, the this person wants to be in. Come on, in union with this. Mm -hmm. 
So you have an object of contemplation. Right. You have the one doing uh -huh. the contemplation. Yeah. And in contrast with nature, nature is itself both object of contemplation and that which contemplates. Yeah. And it doesn't, this requires recursive, discursive reasoning, right? reasoning, step-by-step <coughs> -step processes, that's not present in nature. Jump in. Is it possible for both of those to take place at the same time? What did he say? Is it possible for both of those to take place at the same time? The contemplation Is it possible action? for? The contemplation and the... The, of action and nature? And the action in nature. Is it possible for them both to take place at the same time? I guess at that final moment. Yeah. But um, it's really, uh, see, fixing your mind. <clears throat> It's a question of language, you know. Like in yoga, there are three words. There, there's a distinction between concentration, right? concentration, meditation, and contemplation. And uh, we often just use one term, contemplation. But this introduces a nice distinction. T to be able to hold an object in your mind for however long you do it is concentration. Okay. To be able to maintain that over a given period of time, that is to say you can do it again and again as a practice, is meditation. To merge with the object of your Meditation is contemplation. These are three different levels. Together, they're called samyama. And therefore, they say if you can pull that, those three on any object, then you can grasp the nature of the object. Same thing here. We're saying, see, we, this guy has to focus <coughs> his mind, does he not, on his goal, and his parents are likely to help him by saying, don't you? Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 I forgot I shouldn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll stay home and study. Concentration. Meditation. He does it voluntarily. He's now in it. Contemplation. When he's now, he now sees through what it is he has learned. Spontaneously, he knows it so well, he can function through it and see it and live it, like learning a new language, right? You're suddenly doing something rather curious. But it's contemplation yeah, because the same thing? Is contemplation then the same thing as operating? As operating with it? Yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're equivalent you can, terms? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, you can operate with it. Um, and contemplation. When Arjuna goes into battle and slays everybody, He's fixing his mind on the idea of the self or Atman as he goes into battle, slaying anything and everything in front of him, hopefully not his own troops. And therefore, that's combining contemplation and action. Yeah, so it's such a... And most... Uh, this is why in Patanjali's yoga, he says... Women can achieve enlightenment during birth process because they pour all of their energy and all of their thoughts and their power on the object, right? concentrate on it. They keep their mind on it. They become one with it, and that becomes the birth process of the high point. And at that time, they forget themselves. They're totally involved in the activity, and those are key moments for enlightenment. Men, no matter no matter who they are, even from Brooklyn, have difficulty giving birth. <laughs> oh my! Yeah, 
Well, that was a statistical study by a friend of mine. Mm. Uh, Dravidovich McGee Gesundheit was his name. <laughs> what are we going to do next time? We do another, another Plotinus. What haven't we done? We've Maybe. done beauty? Were you going to take this back into the descent of the soul or not? I think we I did. Did, we, did we do descent of the soul? That was what you said. I no, we started to. Said. We didn't get into it. We didn't get into the descent of the soul? No, we started to, and then it went somewhere else. Why, you should have complained. We did. <laughs> okay, so, that's why we're going back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, look here. You'll see the section on dialectic is one of the short ones. It's only six sections. And it should come as a surprise to you, since it doesn't look like anything you've ever heard, being dialectic. So, uh, since it's so short, why don't we do then the descent of the soul? And the dialectic too? And the dialectic. And you'll see in both of these that he's not a Platonist. He's in, right? Be, that should be very clear and evident. He's a contemplatist. Well, <laughs> see, you can you be a contemplate, you can be a, into contemplation without being a platonist. But uh, the scent of the soul, you'll see, he's not platonic. The lost words on that one. Okay. And, and as well in the sense. Pardon me? And as well in the sense. Yes, both. Yeah, because the dialectic is so simple. No, no. I, at first you said you'll see in both that he's not a place. Yes. I was going to put this quote done. into my message, you see. Yes, so. thank you. All uh, right. Both being dialectic and, and, and central soul. soul. Yeah, let's take a look at, at the dialectic while we have a moment here. Now, to play the game, to make sure, it's good to look at just a couple of paragraphs, book six and book seven of the Republic, and just check where he talks about dialectics since they are different in those two books. Oh, keep that in your mind when you're going through the section on dialectic. first paragraph in the dialectic gives the goal. So fix that in your mind. <clears throat> and these are the questions we can judge the essay on. What is the skill, the method, 
One, two. The discipline. That will bring us where we want to go. Three things. We may take it agreed that our goal is the good. Okay. What kinds of people or beings can take the trip? Philosophers, musicians, and a born lover. What's the course? It has two stages. <clears throat> the first, for those who are rising to the intelligible realm from here below, and the second, for those that have already reached it <clears throat> and taken root there and, um, and who must proceed from there till they have reached the summit, the highest point in the realm of intelligence, which is the goal of their journeying. Now we're going to put aside the second of these, talk about the first. So then he starts, would you agree with the discussion on the musician? Pulls it off into the second section. Third section is the philosopher. And therefore you land in the fourth section on the training in the dialectic. Agree on page 121? This training in dialectic is to be imported to all three types of men. It's the art of reasoning that enables us to say what each thing is, and what it differs from other things, what it resembles and what it resembles them, and what category it is, where it stands therein, whether or not it is a true existent, how many existences there are, how many non-existences. And, of course, distinguish them from existences. It also treats of what is good, what's not, what's subordinate to the good, what is subordinate to its opposite, of the nature of the eternal, that which is not, with sure knowledge about everything and not mere opinion. It's to put an end to error. It concentrates its whole attention there. It uses the, the, uh, Plato's method of division in order to distinguish ideas to define each object to separate the supreme kinds of being. It alternates between synthesis and analysis until it has gone through the entire domain of the intelligible and has arrived at the principle. Where does it get its principles? Section 5. Well, you already have a discussion of the dialectic I just read, so keep that in mind, okay? Which is section four, five. Where does it get its principles? Well, dialectic uh, resorts to synthesis, combination, division, until it arrives at perfect understanding. Because you know what? Dialectic is the uh, purest part of intelligence and wisdom. Therefore, since dialectic is the most valuable mental discipline, it must be directed to being and to the existence that is of the most value, which is to say, as wisdom, it is concerned with being. And as intelligence, it's concerned with what is beyond being. But is not philosophy the most valuable mental discipline? Sure, dialectic. That's yeah, the same as philosophy. But dialectic is the most valuable part of philosophy, not just a tool. Now, 
Now, go to top of 123 and you come right to a very interesting part. Dialectic has no knowledge of propositions as such, but it knows the propositions and knowing the truth. In general, it knows the operations of the soul, affirmation and denial, whether denial is of affirmation or of something else. It knows identity and difference. These it grasps as immediately as sensation grasps its objects. But, you know, dialectic is the most valuable, you know, most valuable, but philosophy has other parts. It studies nature using dialectic as other sciences use arithmetic. But drawing a much greater benefit from dialectic because they are so closely allied. Aided by dialectic, philosophy treats of conduct, the study of habits, and the exercises productive of good habits. The rational habits derive their characteristic from dialectic and preserve much of it, even in their interaction with material things. big issue on 123, therefore, the relationship between dialectic and the virtues. Virtues must either precede or accompany the progress made in dialectic. The natural virtues one possesses will, with the assistance of wisdom, become perfect virtues. Wisdom comes after the natural virtues to perfect the habitual. Natural virtues either grow or are perfected along with wisdom, or wisdom uh, uh, enters at one point and perfects them. In general, natural virtue implies only imperfect vision and conduct. Our perfection we owe primarily to both natural virtue and wisdom. So from this you can then practice dialectic, can't you? No. Oh, yeah. Let's pick it right up. Right, and you'll then, when we come back, go back over this and look over the two sections in Book 6 and Book 7 on dialectic and go back and compare it. Right? That's where we're going? Okay. See you then. Thank you so much.